نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way he deserves to be praised and we bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah he has no partners and we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a slave and his messenger we ask Allah to exalt his mention and grant him peace and send his salutations and blessings upon him and upon his companions and wives and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense. Brothers in faith, every now and then, someone shares something that is worthy of criticism. Now that the technology and the smartphones specifically have become an integral part of everyone's life in one way or another with the exception of a minority the amount of information that is now being shared is beyond overwhelming and while these tools are like a knife <coughs> which can be used for you to cut up your food or can be used as a weapon to kill somebody. While there's no specific ruling on them, because the ruling has to do with the usage, the truth of the matter is for the vast majority, it is being misused. And if we don't filter out the information that is being spread, and if we don't take action against it, then believe it or not, and you have no choice but to believe it, because this is based on the Quran and the Sunnah, we will come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah with loads of sins on our backs because of something that you might have just shared. Something you didn't author, you didn't invent, you didn't create, you merely forwarded a message that you received. Perhaps an action that took you a few seconds. But the amount of evil and misguidance associated with this message is something that you did not perceive. And you could not perceive. Either because of lack of knowledge, or because of carelessness and negligence, or just being oblivious to what's going on in the world. And the matter becomes more, more dangerous when information is being shared on a group and in any given group you will have various people of various levels of understanding and while some are able to shun and avoid the garbage and the junk that is being shared many will fall victim and it will create a doubt in their mind that they were better off without. Fundamentally speaking, Islam does not want you to open up the door of doubt upon yourself and then go through a vigorous mission of trying to resolve them one by one. Because not everyone is capable of doing so. Rather, Islam <coughs> came to close the doors, not as said to the liar. Shutting down the doors which lead to potential evil. Things which may lead to kufr and shirk and disbelief. It closes the door early on. 
Otherwise, a person will be led gradually by the shaitan until they find themselves in no man's land with a no way back ticket. They can't find their way back to where they once were. And interestingly, last night I received the message. The irony of the situation is that that message is sent by someone who doesn't even believe in God. And the objective of them forwarding this message or this video clip is to mock the believers in God. The twist in it, the twist in the story is that some uh, Muslim and there are other related articles in various newspapers that are connected either to the story or other but it's the same idea that a Muslim had an issue with the two children that were born and one of them died. The story that I received is a video was about a blind woman and then there's a similar story in, in a newspaper, in a Lebanese newspaper about two children, Muhammad and Ali who were born with some twins with some defect of some sort and supposedly Muhammad couldn't make it, he died and Ali was the one who was possibly going to survive and they had oxygen on that person, you know, that, on that little infant trying to keep him alive. And in both stories, a person, a saint from Christianity, and it's funny, it's funny to the Muslim, and it's funny to the Lebanese Muslim specifically because it's connected with our craziness back home. Because in Lebanon, in that part of the world, they are famous for inventing Christian denominations that you won't find anywhere else in the world. Like Christianity is already divided into as many denominations as you can think of. But over there we have above and beyond the normal, the Maronites Christian. And among the Maronites Christian is a saint called Sherbil. Some nobody, obviously who is, has this ability to cure. And so in the case of the video, this lady who went blind, she made dua to Saint Sherbil, and then miraculously, her vision was restored. And they have the story on the news, I don't know if it was BBC or CNN, or what are these crazy channels? Her vision was restored and you know the climax of the story and the people they got to say this is unbelievable and suddenly she this and suddenly she that and da 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 You know you start like oh wow 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 and then at the end of the video at the end of the video the one reporting said and by the way we usually like to verify our stories however that lady refused to give us the medical reports. Please. Since your story is so miraculous, could you not just provide the TV station with the medical report that you were once a person who can see, then you became medically blind and now your vision was restored? I mean, that would be only fair, but no, no, no. She can come on TV and she can tell you the story about the miracle, but somehow, some way, miraculously also, she couldn't provide the medical reports that prove the outline of the story. I'm not surprised. Because in the news article, the story has a twist. So this uh, mother of Ali or the father of Ali, the son who's in between life and death, doctors gave up on him, it's a matter of time before he dies, blah, blah, blah. Someone told her, you have no one to aid you in this matter except Saint Sherbil. I mean, Saint Sherbil is a, is a gangster in this, in this field. I mean, he's just making it happen to every, any sick person. You just bring him. He's going to fix you up. So she said, okay. And then you have to get specifically some oil from the church of St. Sherbet. So she went to consult her Christian friend. And I love how these stories are made. So dramatic, so opera style. She went to consult her Christian friend, that Muslim, Sunni father and mother, about how she said, you have the best luck in the world. 
I was just there yesterday and I happened to bring some oil with me. So they're trying to save on gas, I guess. She, she does not have to take the trip over there. So the oil was brought conveniently to her. She rushed to the hospital to oint the, ch the child with that oil while the doctors are trying to prevent her because you know in the medical world it's like you crazy what do you mean they're gonna put oil this oil can have some bacteria or microbes i mean this could be detrimental to the health of the child somehow you know the superwoman pushed them off you know back off this is my he's dying anyways i'm gonna do this and she rubbed the famous miraculous oil that saint sherbin who had died already by the way somehow blessed because it came from his church and of course the stuff is sold for money. They're not giving it away for free. And then she went home, because usually parents leave their children in the hospital on the verge of death, in case you didn't know. They just leave them. Went home and got a phone call, come, come, pick up your son. He's off the oxygen thing. What happened? He's done, he's cured. Khalas. The oil fixed it. And then of course, to put further doubt in the minds of the people, the Mawlana Sheikh himself, said, I'm a Sunni Muslim, but now I believe in St. Sharbin. And he had to go to the church and pay dues to St. Sharbin. And now he regularly, regularly prays, prays, salah, prays, not prays to pray someone, no, no, he does salah, ibadah, dua to St. Sharbin. And he advises all fellow Muslims to do the same. And you, you hear stuff like that, and you read stuff like that, and you get really irritated. <coughs> and I have no doubt that for many Muslims, they don't have an answer for this. News of the sword is mind-boggling to them. They're like, wait a second, so, so how does this work? How is it that a Christian will call on Jesus, for example, and he gets what he wants? Or a Buddhist will call him Buddha and he gets what he wants. And so on and so forth. How do we understand this in the Islamic context? There's a religious explanation and there's a logical explanation. What I'm most interest is, interested in as usual is the religious explanation. And then I will give you a logical relief. So that you don't get caught up in this satanic nonsense and plots. First and foremost. Allah Azza wa Jal already established in the Quran in hundreds of verses two things that calling on anyone other than Allah is shirk that will land you in the hellfire eternally and this is an area where it is absolutely no mercy no forgiveness, no leeway, nothing it's black and white you call on anyone other than Allah Beginning with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in spite of his status with Allah. Going to the other Anbiya, going to the Malaika, going to Abdul Qadir al-Jilani or Sitna Zainab. And the list goes on of the awliya of the Sufis. The Sufis and the list of people that they call on to besides Allah, both dead and alive. You call on anyone other than Allah and you are a mushrik. Just like the people of Quraysh at the time of the Prophet وسلم, rather you are worse. And this area is non-negotiable. And you will not find anything authentic in the Quran and the Sunnah that will support your contrary view. If Allah afflicts you with harm, they will, there is no one who will remove it except Him. Understand this in Arabic, understand it in English, understand it in Urdu, whatever language you want. You will not find multiple interpretations for an ayah of this sort. This is called Al-Muhkam. This is an ayah that is entirely clear. This is from Ummul Kitab, as Allah says in the Quran. It has entirely clear ayat, they are the mother of the book. And Allah says, Lahu da'watul haqq. To Allah belongs the true supplication and the true call. وَالَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِهِ لَا يَسْتَجِبُونَ لَهُمْ بِشَيْءٍ 
and those whom they call on other than Him, do not respond to them in anything. Except like the one who was trying to reach out to some water, and the water is not reaching his mouth. It's like you have water in your hand and you want to drink it, but there's a, there's a barrier. You can't benefit from it. Similarly, they will never benefit. And the supplication of the, mis of the disbelievers is nothing but a waste. It is a complete, utter waste. <coughs> and the ayat are many. Allah says, إِن تَدْعُوهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُوا دُعَاءَكُمْ If you call on them, they do not hear your supplication. وَلَوْ سَمِعُوا مَسْتَجَبُوا لَكُمْ And even if they were given the ability to hear, they will never respond to you. وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكْفُرُونَ بِشِرْكِكُمْ And on the day of judgment, they will declare their disassociation from your polytheism. People like Jesus a noble man, on the day of judgment, before Allah, he will declare his innocence from all the Christians. He never, he never told them to worship him. He never told them he was God. He never told them he was the son of God. Never told them he was the inter intermediary between them and God. And other Muslim scholars who turned, who were turned into saints by their followers like Abdul Qadir al Jilani and others. They will also declare their innocence from these so-called followers of theirs. They will disassociate themselves from these people. And the ayat are many. The ayat are many to this effect. You are dua, a dua who al ibadah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, dua is worship. Dua is worship. Once you call on someone other than Allah regarding matters that are only specific to Allah, then you're out. Don't come be funny and say, well, if you call your brother for something or you ask for help, does that, that does not fall under the same category, obviously. Because Allah gave human beings the ability to aid other human beings in handing you a chair or a book or a mushaf. But in matters of sickness, life, death, risk, prosperity, guidance, these are only purely, strictly in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no other creation is involved and you may not ask anyone other than Allah. Nor may you take what they call a wasila, tawassul, and seeking through the virtue of someone either. As some claim that the Prophet sallallahu can do for them. That they call on Allah through the wasila of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I have a whole lecture on this topic called Tawassul. Look it up on YouTube. Tawassul, put my name next to it, Wajdi. Read, watch the lecture. Understand this is a very critical subject matter. In subcontinent and in the Middle East. These two, these two regions are famous for khurafat and nonsense and, and all types of craziness related to this topic. People want to involve the Prophet sallallahu alayhi in every dua. And that they don't get anything except through the virtue of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Especially after he passed away alayhi salatu wasalam. During his life, of course, of course his dua was accepted. And you could go say, Ya Rasulullah, make dua for Allah for me. After his death, if that was the case, then the Sahaba would have done so. But they continued to seek through Allah Azza wa Jal alone. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Brothers, these are the foundations of faith. And this is the reality of Tawheed. And this is something you have to be firm, firm in your heart about. Don't let the shayateen of the dunya deviate you or confuse you about the subject matter. Anything that the people call on besides Allah does not respond to them, does not recognize them, does not identify them. They don't even identify them. These aslam, these statues are useless. These statues were made by us. Human beings are creating their own object of worship. It's, um, it's crazy. These statues are so dependent that they had to be made by the humans. Maintained by the humans. If a bird was to urinate on one of these statues, it has no power to prevent it. How is that an object of worship, ya jama'ah? How do you call on something that needs you more than you need it? 
And I saw some videos of Hindus beating up some Muslims for transporting some cows. Because they accuse them that these cows are going, they are transporting from one place to another. They are doing so for the purpose of slaughtering them. And they got these Muslims and they beat them to death in the street. How stupid can you be? You try to protect your God? If this is you got your cow, if the God is a cow, then what is it waiting for people to grab it and slaughter it? Where's your brain? Where's the intellect Allah gave you that makes you superior to the animal? Wallah, the animals are superior to those. And Allah told us this in the Quran. They are more misguided than the, than the behaim, than the cattle and the livestock. Subhanallah. Whereas you as a Muslim, you have no issues. <coughs> you worship the creator of the heavens and earth who cannot be seen. If he were to be seen, it would be a disaster. If he had an image that we were aware of, we, it would be a disaster. Alhamdulillah, Allah protect us, protected this deen from imagery and the worship of idols and idolatry. And still Muslims want to involve them somehow, insert them somehow into the deen to corrupt the purity of Tawheed. Then we wonder why the Ummah is suffering. There are no surprises there. In the second part of the khutbah, we will discuss the logical aspect of this. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyan Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. In regards to this idea that there are certain people that can cure others and heal others and perform out of this world supernatural events and so on and so forth. The first thing you need to know is that 99% of this stuff is nothing but hoaxes and lies. There are books that have been authored about this and documentaries that have been made online that you can watch them, especially in Christendom where they bring some, some funny guy who goes to church and then all these people like this, uh, the handicapped and the wheelchair and the one with I don't know what, they come up to them and he does some harakat and all this and bam! And then the guy, mashallah, tabarakallah, gets up like nothing ever happened to him. You better believe that a lot of this stuff is staged. Not a lot, in fact, all of it is staged. It is staged. These are paid people for objectives. It is known. We've discovered this so many times in our country. They kept saying that there's this amazing image of one of the saints that kept leaking. It kept leaking. They said this is tears. There are tears coming down of his eyes. They found out that the toilet on the second floor was leaking. Another one that claimed that this the saint in the picture, it had oil coming out of their mouth. They removed it, they found it was a pump. Some funny guy installed a pump with the remote control, he presses it, then it drops. And a lot of the stuff is gimmicks. And human beings, if you want to base your faith on this nonsense, then you can technically believe that an ant is a god. Because let's say Allah Azzawajal had decreed that Fulan will be cured from a disease. Allah had already preordained and predestined that one person would be cured from a disease. You came to this wall and said, Ya wall, cure my, my uncle. And then the next day your uncle cured. You go to associate now the cure, the cure and the, the well, wellness of your uncle with the wall. <coughs> ya akhi, but this is something Allah had predecreed. How do you know that it is that dua you made to the wall? If so, then this wall becomes worthy of worship. And then we can do the same thing to this microphone. And then we can do it to the box of tissues. And if every time someone asks for something, it happened because it was already pre-decreed by Allah, it makes it worthy of worship, then anything can become an object of worship. And that's why we don't make our faith dependent on subject matters like this. We base our faith on scripture. If a Christian wants to tell you, but my grandfather, Jesus came to him and he rubbed him on his head and he told him this and that and blah, blah, blah. Say that's wonderful, beautiful. And also a Buddhist friend had Buddha come to him and tell him the same thing. So what? Leave Christianity, become a Buddhist? Because a Hindu guy had Shiva come and talk to him. Leave Christianity and Buddhism and become a Hindu? How about a fire worshiper? The fire came and talked to him before he went to sleep. So you yeah, become a fire worshiper. 
How? What is this? Logically speaking, it doesn't fly. It doesn't add up. We don't base our faith on events of this nature because these are from the unseen. And this is a very logical approach to things because you cannot identify the source. And so that answers the second part of the question. If it is not staged, you cannot claim that it is Saint Sharbil who did this or Saint Sharbil who did that. What if, hypothetically, but since the father of Muhammad and Ali had the issue, and supposedly it was Saint Sharbil, what if another Muslim in the Salah, in Sujood, made dua for this Ali and Allah cured him? Assuming the story has any value or any reality to it. How do you know that it wasn't the dua of the Muslim? He has Muslim relatives. How do we know that it's Saint Sharbil that cured him and not the dua that you yourself made as a father to your son? Does anyone re receive a receipt from the heavens that the source of cure was Saint Sharbil? No. Then case closed, Habibi. Case closed. Don't come tell me that we saw on an eggplant the name Jesus or the name I don't know what, therefore this is a sign of Allah. Or some people they bring you a, a tomato or some vegetable and it has the name of Allah or Muhammad Rasulullah or a tree. Besides the fact that most of these are photoshopped, they're photoshopped. If it was real, you don't base your faith on that. Because hypothetically, if someone were to bring another vegetable with another so-called God, now you're forced to accept that God as well. And how did Allah save us from all this you know, all this craziness that human beings like to get involved in? Revelation. Quran, Sunnah. I have these two sources. Come, come. You're a Christian? Bring your Bibles. Bring your Bibles. Whether it is that of the, the Catholics or the Protestants with the book discrepancy between them and the revised editions and the additions and deletions and the list goes on. Bring, bring them. Show me. Show me the difference. I will prove to you that Islam is Haq. Bring the Hindus and their nonsensical books. I will prove to you that Islam is Haq. Bring the Buddhists. Bring any, you know, any religion, any faith, any ideology. Nothing can stand against the Quran and the Sunnah. Nothing in this whole world. And no one can prove the, the opposite of that. No one has been able to and no one will ever be able to. That is what Allah gave us. That is the nur, the light. That is how you know your path to Jannah. So anytime someone forwards something crazy to you, remember, La ilaha illallah. Always reinstate your belief in La ilaha illallah. It will save you when you need it the most. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarrif al-qulub, isrif qulubana ala ta'atik. Rabbana la tuzir qulubana ba'da ad hadaytana. وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم ثبت قلوبنا على دينك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم ثبت قلوبنا على دينك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم ثبت قلوبنا على دينك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم جعلنا من عبادك الصالحين وأوليائك المقربين وتب علينا يا رب العالمين اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلي اللهم وسلم على نبينا محمد